often tell a story about a farmer that one day ran into his house excited and wanted to share good news with his wife and his kids. And he said, honey, the cows just gave birth to twins. One is red and one is white. I am so excited. We've never had twins before, and I want to give one to God. We're going to let them both grow up, and we're going to, let them, uh, we're going to pour into them. We're going to make sure they're healthy, and then when they, when they get bigger, we're going to sell one of them. Actually, we're going to sell both of them. We'll sell one, and we'll keep the proceeds for ourselves, and then we'll sell the other, and we'll give all the proceeds from there to the work of the Lord. We'll give it to the ministry. And so... We don't, and then his wife asked him, hey, how are we going to know which one to give? And he said, well, let's not worry about that right now. We'll treat them both in the same way, and then when time comes, we'll just do as I say. And so they were excited. They started raising the cows, and then a few days later, the husband walked in discouraged and upset and with distraught on his face, and his wife asked what happened. He said, well, um, the Lord's cow just died. Um, that's a silly story. But it illustrates a key point about how we think about our possessions and our stuff. When it comes to our possessions, when it comes to our stuff, when it comes to our things, given the choice between giving them away or keeping them, all of us in this room, whether we want to admit it or not, our inclination is to keep them. In fact, at a certain point, this inclination to keep and accumulate treasure rather than give them away or dispense of them is actually symptomatic of a psychological disorder. Psychologists call it a hoarding disorder. The top two symptoms of this disorder would be A, persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value, and B, the difficulty is due to a perceived need to save the items in distress that's associated with them. See, I wonder how many of us as Christians struggle with these symptoms of hoarding disorder. I wonder how much time and energy do we spend on hoarding up for ourselves treasures on earth rather than treasures in heaven. In this text this morning, Jesus warns us that our hearts are inclined to treasuring up things that are ultimately will not last and will decay and be destroyed and will leave us feeling insecure, empty, and far from God. What about you? What about your treasure? What are you storing up for? Don't leave this morning without honestly asking yourself this question because whether you like it or not, what you treasure is going to transform you. What you treasure and what you pursue is going to change how you live. And this morning what I want to do is I want to show you three things from this text regarding treasure. First, I want to show you two types of treasure. Secondly, I want to talk about why temporal or earthly treasure is so tricky, how it manipulates us. And then finally, I want to share how we can change our attitudes and instead of investing on just temporal stuff, begin to transfer our treasures to heaven. So let's begin with two types of treasure. In this passage, Jesus lays out two broad categories of treasure that encompass everything that we do and everything that we will ever possess. There isn't anything in the world that doesn't fit into these two categories. The first of these categories is earthly treasures. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says it like this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In the original language, the idea isn't do not lay up treasures, but it's stop laying up treasures. The idea is, the implication is that people are already doing this. Our bent is to store stuff up for ourselves. This is everyone's natural inclination apart from God. You don't have to tell people to try and accumulate as much stuff as for themselves as they can. This is merely our human nature. I see this played out with my kids all the time, especially my two older kids when they were smaller. You could put both of them in a room and have a box of crayons in the middle, and one of them is coloring on this side, the other one is coloring on this side, and all of a sudden, my son, Tim, will see that there's a bunch of crayons that he'll want and he doesn't want his sister to have, so he'll grab all of these crayons and keep them to himself, right? And then all of a sudden, Nicole looks, and the box is empty, and she's got like two crayons, and he's got like 30 or 40, and she starts complaining, and I got to talk to Tim and be like, Tim, do you really need all those crayons? 
Can you not share? What are you making a, like a castle or something? You're drawing on an 8 by 11 paper. You don't need all this crayon, right? And he goes, but dad, I need them. I want them. She's going to take them, and then I'm not going to be able to use them. I need them for myself. And then finally, I've got a little bit of talking. He'll to- throw her like two or three crayons, and she'll be happy, but I'm not. And so, but you see the heart behind it? It's, um, I need it. I want it. It's about me. It's about what I have. It's about what I possess. See, most of us aren't busy hoarding crayons, right? That's not what we're doing, but we do hoard our treasures, whatever that may be. For many of us, it might be money, and we hoard lots of it. Why? Because I need it, because I want it. And like my son, when challenged, we might begrudgingly throw a few bucks here or there, but we keep the majority of our stuff for ourselves. It may be in the form of cash or checking or savings or real estate, but nothing short of hoarding while others are trying to make do with next to nothing. And Jesus warns us against treasuring up earthly treasures because even though they're visible now and even though you can see them now and even though you can feel them and use them now, eventually they'll disappear. Eventually they'll be gone. And he's, again in verse 19 he says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust decay and destroy and where thieves break in and steal. These things that we treasure here on earth, those things that are so valuable to us, whatever they happen to be will ultimately be gone. They'll be destroyed. They'll be taken away. Those visible investments that you're pouring your life into today, they appear to be safe bets. They appear to be good. But at the end of the day, they will dissolve into nothing. That's a bad investment. And so Jesus gives us an alternative investment. He says, instead of investing in earthly treasures, begin to invest in heavenly treasures. Invest into things that are of eternal value. Look at verse 20. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And in this verse, we're told, instead of storing up treasures on earth, begin to store up treasures in heaven. The reason we're told not to store up treasures on earth is because they're not going to last. They're going to get destroyed. They're going to decay. They're going to be, thieves can steal them. And conversely, the reason we store up treasures in heaven is because they'll never rot away. They'll never be destroyed. They'll actually last forever. You'll have them for eternity. And it's interesting to compare these two treasures. On the one hand, if you store up earthly treasures, you're going to store up something visible today that's going to be gone tomorrow. But if you're storing up heavenly treasures, you're going to be investing into something invisible today, but it's going to be visible for eternity. See, it's really a question of faith. It's really a question of do you trust Jesus? Do you believe Jesus when he says that all the stuff you're inclined to treasure up here on earth are not going to last, but if you treasure up heavenly things, you're actually going to have them forever. See, the way you know you believe it is not by what you say, because all of us will say that it's, much, it's a much better investment to store into heavenly things, but it's what you do. Where do you spend your money? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your resources? So what are these heavenly treasures that Jesus is talking about? What are these things that Jesus is telling us to invest in? What are these things that Jesus is telling us to store into? It's hard to say exactly what Jesus is saying, but I think... We can safely say that heavenly treasure is anything we do here on earth that has an effect that lasts into eternity. And that can be a huge number of things. Obviously, it can mean giving to the poor or paying your tithes and offering, but it also means giving a cup of cold water to someone that's thirsty. It's pouring into people because you care about them. It could mean teaching a Sunday school class or working in the nursery one week, but it also means seeking to represent Christ on your campus and honoring him with your choices and your actions because people are watching and their lives matter and it's not just about you and your desires because you represent someone so much bigger than you. It could be starting a Christian nonprofit where um, you're able to raise funds to promote the gospel throughout the world, but it also could mean that where you work, You do it for the glory of God and the good of people rather than just to get your name on the door or get promoted or have the corner office. It's not just about you. It's about wanting 
God to be glorified in your actions and people to see Jesus. See, to store up treasures in heaven is to do anything that seeks to promote the name of Jesus over the name of yourself. That might affect your earthly treasure or your wealth. Sometimes it might not. It just means your attitude toward it. But often, in many cases, it is sacrificing your earthly treasures for Christ's sake that creates treasure in heaven. You want to know where your treasure is? Jesus says in verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. If you want to know where your treasure is, the quickest way to find it is just simply follow the money trail. Here's a simple exercise that you could do. The, think about where your money goes the most quickly, the most easy, easily, and with the greatest joy. In other words, where do you spend money or large quantities of money, and it doesn't even feel like it's spending to you? For some of you in this room, it's appearance. It's, for you, it's nothing to shell out huge amounts of money to keep up with the latest styles or simply to make yourself look great. Why? Why is that so important to you? Why is that so easy? Can I suggest to you it's because you treasure what others think about you more than what Jesus thinks about you? For others of you, it's financial security. For you, throwing huge amounts of money into a savings account or investment account is an easy thing for you to do. It doesn't, you don't blink an eye. Why? Because you treasure financial security and the sense of control that it brings. For others of you, it's entertainment. It's pleasure. You can easily shell out huge amounts of money for a great trip or a great dining experience because you treasure those things. And so it doesn't feel like it's spending at all. But let me ask you, how easily does money flow out of your pocket when it comes to giving of your tithes and your offering? How quickly do you respond when there's an opportunity to bless the poor or the city and say, we can make a difference for God's sake? How, what is, how much joy do you have when you have an opportunity to give every week and to invest into the kingdom of God's work? What does that tell you about your treasure? See, take a look at where you're spending your money, the quickest, the easiest, and with the most joy, and there's where you'll find your treasure, but Jesus says beyond that, that's where you're going to find your heart. That's where you're going to find your desires. See, there's only two kinds of treasures in this world. You're either investing in yourself and earthly treasures, or you're investing in heavenly treasures. Think one will be here today and gone tomorrow. The other one, you don't see right now, but you'll have it for eternity. So you have a choice to invest in the temporal or invest in the eternal. Two choices. But... The temporal is incredibly tricky, and here's where I want to share some simple ways why investing into things on this earth is so incredibly tricky. The middle section of the passage that we were looking at this morning is incredibly difficult to translate into English and incredibly difficult to interpret. But I think at the heart of these two verses, the point Jesus is making is that earthly treasure or possession or wealth in and of itself is tricky. And there are four reasons why they're tricky. Number one, we're often blinded to its influence in our lives. We're often blinded to its influence in our lives. Greed and the love of money and the treasuring of earthly things are not sins that we're often inclined to see in ourselves. This makes these sins somewhat unique. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York, wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods. And in the book, he said that Greed is the only sin where Jesus says that we have to be watchful of. He's in Luke 12, he says, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. This is the only sin that Jesus says you have to watch out for. Why? Why does he have to tell us that? He never says, watch out for committing adultery or watch out for committing murder or watch out for that you don't steal. He never has to warn us about that. Why? Because those things, we know when we're doing it. We know when we're stealing. It's not like we don't know what's going on. But the sin of greed, the sin of wanting more to keep for ourselves, and it sounds good because we want financial security or we want to be safe and we want to be secure, and it sounds good, but it, 
if it's not done with the proper attitude and perspective, part of the trickiness is that we think that we're not guilty of it. Somehow this sin blinds us to its effect and leaves us in the dark. See, that's really the point of what Jesus makes in verses 22 and 23. Listen to what he says. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? There's a sense in which the eye gives light to the body like a lamp gives light to a room. Jesus says, hey, if your eye is good or literally single or undistracted, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or literally sick or evil, then your whole body is going to be full of sickness and evil and full of darkness. See, what makes this passage for, so difficult for us to understand is that we don't understand this common metaphor that Jesus is using. So let me show you another place in Scripture where these metaphors are used. In Proverbs 22, Solomon writes it this way. He says, whoever has a good eye will be blessed. The NIV translate this, translates this verse. It says, a generous man will be blessed. In Hebrew, to describe someone with a good eye is to say that this man is generous in all that he does. Over in Proverbs 23, we read, do not eat the bread of a man with a bad eye, or do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. To have a good eye is one who is generous. To have an evil eye is to be one who is stingy. So coming back to our passage in Matthew, it seems that Jesus is communicating that if you have a good eye, if you are generous, if you love to serve and give to people, you will see things clearly. But if you are stingy and only care about yourself, and all, you, all that matters to you is your safety and your security and your desires and your want, then you've got an evil eye and you're not going to be healthy. You're a stingy hoarder of things, one who treasures up things of this world. Your whole life will be lived in the darkness. And if that part of you, which is supposed to give light, actually produces darkness in you, Jesus says, listen, you're in deep trouble at that point. The love of money, the love of earthly treasure blinds us to its influence and its effect on our lives. Number two, earthly treasure is, subtle, is tricky because its influence is subtle but steady. Tim Keller, again, helps us see the subtle influence of treasuring earthly things, of how earthly things works in our lives. See, no matter what product is out there, whether it's a phone or a washing machine or golf clubs or um, a house, there's always a cheaper option or a more expensive option, right? Um, when we start out in life, you college students, if your parents are not paying for it, you're buying the cheaper option. But your desire is that one day you'll make enough money that you can get the more expensive option. We're always keenly aware that there's one level up. There's one level better. That's why these phones, iPhones or Samsungs or whatever you use, there's always, every two years, a new one, a better one that comes out. Why? To tell you, hey, you don't have the best there is. There's another one that's coming out. Grab that one, right? So it's telling you there's always one that's better. So when we get a little bit more money, rather than giving more away, we upgrade to the next level in all those areas that are important to us. So when we come into more money, again, we do it again. So we always stay living on or just below our level of income. See, this is why even though we make more money today than we used to, if you're honest, those of you who work, you don't really feel like you have more money today, do you? Because your expenses have just gone up. Because you have to spend more money. See, this is the seductive power of earthly treasures. This is the power of wanting to invest on things on this earth. A person that makes a $100,000 um, income feels like they have to live a $100,000 lifestyle. A person making a million dollars feels like they have to live a million dollar lifestyle. What if instead, as people of God, we decided that if we were making $100,000, 
we would live with 50,000 and honor God with the choices of our, with the remaining of our money. That we wouldn't just try to spend all that we have, but we were wise in how we used it. How radical would that be? Number three, see, earthly treasure is so tricky because we think we're the only ones who can do what Jesus says that no one can do, serve both God and money. We think we can do that, right? He says very clearly in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. See, almost every one of us believes that we're the exception to that rule. We believe that we have what it takes to do both. And this is part of the trickiness of earthly treasure. When Jesus is talking about serving a master, he's not talking about an employer-employee relationship. That's not the language he's using. He's using the language of a slave and an owner. And what he says is that you will either be a slave to God, fully devoted to God, and wanting to do whatever God wants for your life, or you'll be a slave to money, and you'll be obsessed about making more and more money. You cannot be a slave to both of them. One of those two will own you. One of those two will dictate how you live your life. One of those two will dictate where your future is. And if you think that you can do both, then you need to recognize that you are a slave to money, not God. Number four, earthly treasure is tricky because once we recognize its power in our life and even renounce it, the chains that bind us is not so easily broken. I think this is best illustrated in the life of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie was one of the most wealthiest men in the world. In fact, when he retired at the age of 66, he was the richest man in the entire world. His steel company was the most profitable business at that time. Early on in his success, at the age of 33, in his diary, he took a ruthless look at his own heart, and he said, man must have an idol. The amassing of wealth is one of the worst species of idolatry. No idol is more debasing than the worship of money. Whatever I engage in, I must push extremely. Therefore, should I be careful to choose a life which will be most elevating in my character, to continue much longer overwhelmed with business matters and business cares where most of my thought is about making more money will degrade me beyond hope of permanent recovery. If that continues, I will quit by the age of 35. See, the note is amazing in the way that Carnegie sees the danger between the pursuit of earthly treasure that will ultimately degrade him if he continues pursuing that. How do we break the chain of our slavery to money and earthly treasure? What will set us free from investing everything in visible treasures that will ultimately become invisible and instead investing our lives in invisible treasures that will ultimately become visible and last forever. And here's our final point. How do we transfer our treasures to heaven? See, when you have an idol in your life, when there's something in your life that controls you, you simply don't just remove it. You don't just take it out and get rid of it. It doesn't work. All of us in this room were created to worship. We were made to live for something, and you will live for something. You will find your hope, security, significance in something or someone. The question is, will you find your hope, security, and significance in something that will last? Or will you find your hope, security, and significance in something that is perishable? Will you find your hope, security, and significance in something that is uncertain? Something that's subject to devaluation? Something that's something to... Um, inflation or the economic downturn, something that's subject to aging, something that's abs- or something that is some absolutely certain, invaluable, and never changes. See, if you find your hope, security, and significance in earthly things, that is, if you treasure earthly things, if you treasure what you own or what you have, then you'll always be anxious, you'll always be insecure, and you'll always feel insignificant because that's how earthly things are. You'll never have enough. The things that you own will break, and then you've got to get something new. When you treasure, what you treasure is going to transform you. See, but on the flip side, if you treasure, but if your treasure is in heaven, 
It is secure. It's untouchable. It's of highest value. Then your life will reflect that. You'll be at peace. You'll be unshaken by economic downturns and the effect of the agings of the things that you own because your treasure isn't here or in anything on this earth. It's safeguarded in heaven and it's waiting for you. You and I have to transfer our treasure to heaven from for our treasure from earthly things to heavenly things. Otherwise, we'll live insecure, miserable lives. Let me give you three ways that we do that. Number one, you have to recognize the empty promises of temporal treasure. You have to recognize the empty promises of temporal treasure. Jesus made this very clear. Earthly treasures promise you safety, security, and significance, and yet they give you none of those things. None of those things are given to you. Not only that, but when you're dead, all those things cease to matter. They don't mean anything anymore. Rather than putting your eggs in a basket that won't last, Jesus invites us to put our trust in him and live this life for heaven's sake. you got to recognize the empty promises of temporal treasures. Number two, you have to believe what God said and take him at his word. You've got to believe what God said and take him at his word. There is no mincing of words in this passage when Jesus speaks. If you live for the things of this earth, you will be bankrupt when you die. If you have nothing in this life but live for heavenly reward, you will, live, you will be rich beyond measure for eternity. God says that explicitly. The question is, do you believe him? Have you considered that your possessions and the amount of money and stuff that you have accumulated for yourself will stand as a witness for or against your faith when you stand before God? Number three, you must learn to treasure Jesus by grasping in the deepest part of your heart that he has treasured you. You must learn to treasure Jesus how do you do that? By grasping in the deepest part of your heart that Jesus has first treasured you. See, this point is the most important point in this entire passage. It's not enough to simply believe God or to believe in Jesus. Most of us in this room believe in Jesus and believe in God, and yet we still serve earthly treasures and possessions. But it's only when you learn to treasure Jesus that you will be free from treasuring the things of this world. How do you treasure Jesus? How do you make much of Jesus? You've got to grasp in the deepest part of who you are that before you ever loved Jesus, that he first loved you. That before you ever had a desire for him, he valued you. He treasured you. He was interested in you. The scripture tells us very plainly that Christ had all of the riches and the wealth of heaven. He had everything imaginable. He was comfortable. He was living in luxury. He was on the throne. He lives on, a street, on streets made of gold. He had all that. And because he treasured you, because he treasured me, he willingly gave all of that up. He willingly let go. And he came down. And for our sake, he became poor. He came to earth. Instead of being born in a palace, he was born in a manger. He was a poor man. He lived his life owning nothing but the cloak on his back and the sandals that he wore. And then he suffered and was crucified on a cross, bearing the weight of God's wrath for your sins upon himself. Why? Because despite the fact that we have rebelled against him, despite the fact that we hated him, despite the fact that we did not want anything to do with him, he still looked at us and said, you are my treasure. I love you. I forgive you. I will take your place. He loved you before you loved him. He loved you, and he still loves you today. And then he invites you. He invites you in light of the fact that, in light of that fact, to now make him 
your treasure. To respond to him by saying, Jesus, you are what I long for. You are what I desire. I want to do what you have called me to do. And when you do, then and only then will you be free from the God of money and you'll be able to live to treasure anything, to live for a treasure that nothing on this world can destroy. See, what you treasure will transform you. What you treasure will change you. And this morning, the invitation from Jesus is, will you treasure him? Will you value him more than anything else in this world? Those of you who are working, your job is not simply about making an income. That's part of it. You're called to provide and take care of your family, but you are there because God has put you there. He's put you there so that you can be a blessing. He's given you income not so that you can accumulate wealth and possession, but he's given you jobs. He's made you the rich, one of the richest people in the world compared to the standard of living for the rest of the world and said, you have been blessed, now go be a blessing. And can I say this? We don't give to get. That is a heretical teaching that is contrary to Scripture. We give because we have already been given. He has already given us more than we can dream or ask or think. Jesus doesn't need a penny from us. He doesn't need a cent from us. As a church, we do, but Jesus doesn't, right? Um, so when you give, you're not giving because Jesus is in need or anything like that. You're giving because, you know what, Jesus, when I had no options, you opened doors for me. When I didn't know where my future looked like, you're the one who showed me. When I was lost in sin, you're the one who saved me. And when I give today, I give in an attitude of worship and gratefulness and thankfulness because, God, you have given more than I can deserve. Even if you give me nothing else, you've already blessed me beyond measure. We give not to get. We give because we've already been given. You know, but here's the reward. Jesus says, when you give, you will be blessed. He will provide for you. He will take care of you. Scripture says, and we'll look at this in a few weeks, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll take care of all the other needs of your life. Your attitude is, God, you've blessed me, and when I give, I'm basically saying I trust you with everything that you've given me, and I know that you will take care of me. And so this morning, I want to invite you and challenge you to examine your heart. Some of you guys in this room you might say, I have not a penny to give for offering, but you somehow find a way to eat out like 15, 16 times a week. Not, not judging you, but could you examine your heart to say, what are you treasuring? What, what matters to you? Who's the one that blessed you with that? Who has provided for you? And when you say, I don't want to give, it's saying, I did this. It's not that, God, you helped me. So I just want to invite you to examine your heart here. Examine, what do you treasure? It is not a bad thing to possess stuff. That is not what I'm communicating at all. It is not a bad thing to eat. We, you know we love to eat around here. That is one of our spiritual gifts as a church. Um, that's what we do. We, we, but if all we spend our money on is eating and not pouring into the work of God, that shows where our heart is. And so my invitation to you this morning is examine your heart. Do you treasure Jesus? Do you see that he has treasured you? Do you see that he gave his life for you? You give because he already gave. He didn't just give a few dollars for you. He gave his life for you. He has redeemed you. You were an orphan, and now you were a child of God. You were a stranger, and now you were a friend. You were an outcast, and now you're part of the family of God. He gave of himself for you. So examine your heart. See, the greatest evidence that he gave is the table that we're about to celebrate. This table communicates to us that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. This table communicates to us that when we wanted nothing to do with God, 
He came and took our place. He died the death that you and I should have died after living the life that you and I should have lived. Took our place on the cross so that this morning we don't sit here condemned, rejected. We sit here forgiven, accepted, loved, children of Almighty God. So when we come to the table this morning, we don't come saying, God, I'm trying to earn something from you. We come saying, God, because your son Jesus died for me, I belong to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. So this morning, I want to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Is Jesus really your treasure? Do you treasure him? Beyond that, do you see that he has treasured you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus. Can I say to you that maybe God has brought you here this morning to let you know that Jesus treasures you. He loves you. And if you're not a fully devoted follower of Jesus, don't leave here this morning without giving your life to him. He loves you. He cares for you. If you're a follower of Jesus and your, your pursuit is trying to make a name for yourself or trying to find financial security and trying to build wealth for yourself, and none of those things are bad, but if that is your treasure, can I say, run to the cross this morning, plead forgiveness because you are putting Jesus as secondary to things that will fade away in your life. Pursue Jesus. Pursue him with your life and let him take care of all the other details of your life. Love him more than you love wealth. Love him more than you love straight A's. Love him more than you love your car or your phone or your possessions. Pursue him. Why? Because he's pursued you. Because he's treasured you. So this morning as we come to the table, the way we do communion here at Loft City is we invite you to examine your heart, your life. Whenever you are ready to come and grab the elements, we invite you to come and grab the elements and then you can come back to your seats and I'll come up in a few moments and we'll partake of the table together. But would you spend a few moments before God and let God and the Holy Spirit deal with you and then let's worship by taking communion together. Let's worship.